Hello everybody, I'm Caleb Hack. Welcome to another video. I read five books this month, and the first book I read was Lord of the Flies. This book was so good. It's, it's my favorite fiction book. And what I think this shows is not only a great plot, it shows characters, and it, it gives depth in the characters. You quickly understand how things degenerate so fast. And this is what happens in the book. And I don't want to spoil it too much, but some people have compared it a bit to World War II. And I don't want to say which character represents, and I think it's just too good for me to spoil. I'm actually going to recommend this book 10 out of 10. The next book is The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels by Alex Epstein. This book was given to me by someone I know. And if you're watching this video, thank you so much. I appreciated reading it. But now to get into the book. This book had so much potential to be better. The problem with this book was the science. He had a good idea. The idea was, let me explore what the moral case for fossil fuels is. Why should we use fossil fuels? What's the benefit? And I think that's a perfectly good argument to bring to the table. Let's accept the science and let's say, let's bring it to a policy side. And as you know, in the past, I've read a decent amount of climate change book. I actually made a climate change paper. It was 52 pages long. This isn't me bragging, but this is me showing that, it, that the subject grips me. There's so much to it, right? It's not as simple as whether it exists. It's not as simple as whether the effects are devastating enough to do something. And it's not as simple as even what should we do it from a policy side. There's so many different things to evaluate. It deals with every single country. I mean, it's, it's an international problem. There's so much to be explored and that's why it grips me. And Alex Epstein draws a conclusion. The problem is there are some problems to his conclusion and I do want to point those out. Me pointing out all the scientific errors is coming up from my own. I found this article online and the one thing he says is that CO2 is plant food with a fertilizing impact. The website says a ridiculous argument. Plants need much more than just CO2. They need water and other minerals and soil. The fact that plants in a greenhouse grow better when some CO2 is added doesn't scale up to the planet as a whole. For example, plants exposed to more CO2 can be vulnerable to pests and reduce the quality of crops. Number two, you can't rely on science mo models. Epstein argues that the case for climate change rests largely on climate models, of which he writes, those models have failed to make accurate predictions, not just a little, but completely. But a recent study has shown that actually climate models can have been very accurate and actually can be more conservative than what is actually unfolding. Stein writes, just about every prediction or prescription you hear about the issue of climate change is based on models. But it's not. The whole picture is also supported by a huge body of evidence of the impacts unfolding in our world around us, often in ways predicted by models. Myth three, there is no 97 consensus among climate scientists. Okay, so he attacks a 97% consensus of scientists. There's a lot of discussion as to whether it's true or not. So the first thing he does is he only lists one 97% consensus. And that was done by the founder of Skeptical Science. And he says that it was wrong, but just doesn't talk about all the other that happened. I mean, so his first argument against the 97% consensus is that it's too vague. But isn't that kind of the entire point to make a generalization? What do the 97% scientists believe in? And the answer is that there is climate change and it is man-made. How do we know that 97 agree? So he says that Cook's summary of the 97% consensus is wrong. Some that were miscategorized and he gives quotes. The problem is that Richard Toll, the guy he quotes, says this. There's no doubt in mind that the literature on climate change overwhelming supports the hypotheses that, the, that climate change is caused by humans. I have very little to doubt that the consensus is indeed correct. He quoted Richard Toll, but he changed his opinion. So let me quote someone who says it's not an accurate representation of my paper, but then later changes what he says. It completely undermines that quote. So one of the quotes is gone. So he has three quotes from different people. The problem is that Craig D. Eidslow, and the problem with that is that it's funded by ExxonMobil. Two out of four of the guys he quotes where I think is the most proof in what he's saying against the 97% consensus. And if you don't believe me, fine. I'm going to give a link below in the description. He quoted four people and the two others. Well, okay. Problem is they updated the consensus. They updated the consensus. Still 97%. And then there's another problem. And again, article linked in the description below. Listen to this. Cook reviewed 11,000 
944 peer-reviewed articles from 1991 to 2011. They require that it had to be counted as part of the consensus. An argument had to endorse by explicitly stating that humans are a primary cause of recent global warming. This led them to reject 7,930 articles, which they calculated a consensus of 97.1%. If they used the rejection of global warming, they would have reported a consensus of 99.8%. If you actually take the ones that were rejected, we would get a 99.8% consensus. Fourth myth is that scientists in the 70s predicted there was global cooling. So what do they know? Reality is that even in the 70s, when climate science was in its infancy, there were six times more scientists predicting global warming than global cooling. He thinks that fossil fuels are cheap, plentiful, and that are, it's our only option compared to the others. And that would be an argument. That's what the argument he should have made and would have been way better if that was the case, but he didn't. The next book is The Great Influenza. Now, this book was so good. The only problem with it is that about midway from the book, I'm gonna say somewhere between 200 and 300 pages, it got a little stale, a little repetitive, and there's some overlap because as you know from my previous video, I read a book called Titan and it's about the life of John D. Rockefeller. And he funded John Hopkins University. And this school talks about epidemiology, virology, vaccines, just diseases in general, especially influenza. He gives a great overview. It's not just about the great influenza of 1918, but it's also about what was happening at the time because the context he says how it starts he talks about all the different deaths that happened this book is eight out of ten the next book i'm going to be talking about is the catcher in the rye this book was okay i thought it was quasi interesting but your time would be better spent reading another book as far as fiction goes i want to say it's incredibly captivating this book is six out of ten the next book is Endurance, which was also given to me. And, and thank you for those who gave this to me. This book is incredibly great at describing things. And it's kind of actually ironic, the fact that the name of the ship that breaks is called the Endurance, and the fact that they endure through all of that suffering. The one thing that maybe you could criticize about this book is that maybe it should have just stuck to the Arctic story and didn't proceed after that. Like, that could be a criticism. I didn't mind it all that much, but... You know, I was kind of like, maybe they should have taken it out. Maybe they shouldn't have and not just focused straightly on Shackleton. One of the things actually while reading this book in one of my podcast episodes, they talked about rogue waves, which Shackleton did describe a rogue wave that was two times as large as all the other waves. It's actually really interesting to read up on because we know that they exist. And, and some people think that the sea monsters that sailors used to describe were actually rogue waves that they thought were giant creatures. And when you are sailing, there's two different explanations of why you see a rogue wave. First is paranoia, and then second is the fact that there's actually rogue waves. Some people say that Shackleton didn't actually see a rogue wave. I'm not saying that explanation is bad, but the fact that we know rogue waves exist, and again, I encourage you guys to look that up because it's incredibly interesting. I rate this book 7 out of 10. All right, thank you guys everyone for watching. Again, links in the description down below for what I talked about on the moral case for fossil fuels i hope you guys enjoyed i think that out of all these books my personal favorite book of the month is lord of the flies i hope you guys enjoyed caleb hack signing out